Amen. Praise the Lord. He is great. Amen. Well, this morning, just uh, letting you know, Brother Joe is in Belize. Now he had some matters to take care of there, so be continuing to pray for him. But this morning, we are continuing on in the series on our family foundation, so we'll just continue on one more sermon on that. But first, I want to mention a truck driver had it was hauling a big load and decided it was time to pull in with his big load to a restaurant and eat breakfast, so he pulled on in there and started eating. About midway through his breakfast, the truck driver noticed some Harley riders pulled in, and man, they looked pretty burly, and they looked like they were part of a gang and looked pretty tough, and they walk in the door, and the three of them walk by the truck driver, who's a frail, small little man eating his breakfast, and one of them took their cigarette and stuffed it in his eggs, and the other took the coffee and poured it in his lap, and the other one went up there and flipped his plate up and all of the contents went on his lap. And the little frail, small truck driver man didn't say a word. He just got out his money and enough for the meal and a tip and laid it on the table and just walked out quietly outside the door. Truck driver, the Harley riders went over to their table and waitress came up to take their order and the Harley riders were just all arrogant and said, man, did you see that guy over there? Said he wasn't much of a man, was he? The waitress taking the orders looking out the window and said, well, he's not much of a truck driver either. He just ran over three motorcycles out in the parking lot. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so, you know, we all want to have our definition of what a man is, what a woman is, what a husband is, what a wife is, and what a parent is. But we can't go to the world for those definitions. We've got to go to the Scripture and find out what all the Bible says about those things. And so... This morning, the uh, part three is encourager or exasperator. What kind of parent will we be or grandparent will we be? Or really, as far as that go, uh, any kind of person. Are you an exasperator or an encourager? You know, usually we fall into one of those two categories, and this morning we want to see the difference. And our main focal point this morning is, is in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Don't exasperate them. Uh, we look first of all that verse and the word father there in the Greek can be translated parents. Uh, one theologian is an expert in the language. He goes even further than that and said it's, it's rather to be translated parent than father. But either the case it either can or should be translated parents. So this applies to both fathers and mothers not to exasperate your children. Uh, a similar and exasperate obviously has to do with causing someone to lose heart or be discouraged. You know, that doesn't mean they won't be corrected, but they're not going to be the corrected to the point where they just lose heart and lose hope and, and become discouraged and lose their courage. Uh, Ephesians 6, 4 almost says the same thing, fathers, which can be translated parent. Do not provoke your children to anger, other, but in other words, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't, don't provoke them. It says in Ephesians, don't exasperate them. It says in Colossians. And so, so those are two things that we want to focus in. Matter of fact, this word exasperate is only used here in all the Scripture. In other words, you look at all the New Testament, you always say, well, the word's used elsewhere, and the word's used here, and the word's used there. It's not used anywhere else but here. To exasperate, to cause, to lose courage. We can do this with friends. We can cause to do this with Obviously, our children, our spouse, co-workers, we can cause people to lose courage and to become exasperated. And so we want to find out how to avoid those things. And so this morning, we're going to look at 10 ways that uh, uh, will help us all to avoid exasperating our children or even exasperating, could I say, a lot of the people uh, around about us. And we'll be looking at several things. A few of the points kind of will... Uh, mirror some of the points that Brother Joe mentioned last week, even though we won't, uh, we're going to be looking at a different angle. Some of those will be the same. But uh, also, uh, we won't be covering discipline because if you don't discipline right, that exasperates your children. But Brother Joe covered that real well last week. And if you didn't get that, you need to get that tape because if you don't do the right kind of discipline, as he went over, that will also exasperate your children. And of course, we won't be looking at that one point uh, because uh, that was covered so well last week. So let's begin with this one, though, to avoid excessive control or no control at all. 
Either one of those two extremes can cause your children to be exasperated. Just too much control. I mean, they can't even go lift a pencil without permission. I mean, you just are too micromanaged of every little single thing that's not of major concern or concern that's going to really affect them. Or you just don't have any control uh, at all. There's a balance for any parent to be able to look which way causes these things to, to, to work out right. So we need to look at that. You know, you look at a few uh, examples. King David with his son, Adijah, uh, the scripture says there that his father, that's David, never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? Go back and look a little bit at what happened with his life. You know, we're not, we can't control every aspect of what our children or grown children will do, but he never crossed him at once, it sounds like, ever growing up. You know, to say, hey, wait, control this, stop this, this isn't right. And uh, so we can see what happened there. We know the, the children of uh, Eli, his sons, brought a curse on themselves, and he, that's Eli, did not rebuke them. He didn't correct them. He didn't say, that's enough. That's enough limit to that. We need to stop that. You know, so we can see all in Scripture that we have to bring limit. God's our Father. He brings limits, rules, uh, control. I mean, there's some things we have freedom to do in Christ, but there's things that the Scripture does restrict us in, and those are the things we also have to watch. You know, if you you went up to your children and say, hey, we got a little vote here. Would you like more or less control? You know, we, we know what that would be. It'd be a 100% vote on less control. I mean, that's what, you know. But if you're looking at reality, grown children that have no control would look back and say, probably make a comment like this, my parents didn't love me. They wouldn't say that then probably, but children want a boundary. They may not say that, but, you know, and plus if they don't have a boundary, they'll come out with a mentality of this. I'm smart enough to run my own life. Some children out there going, I am. (laughs) Yeah, all that 10, 12, 14 years experience, you're ready to hit it, aren't you? You know, sometimes we as adults thinking, man, uh, we keep wanting to gain more and more wisdom, thinking, you know, are we here even yet? You know, and here's a person who's not even a teenager or teenager thinking they've they've got it all wired up. You know, they know uh, that they want to control their own life. You begin to think, then why do you need parents at all? You know, why did even God give us parents if you could do it all on your own and run it all on your own life? You know, you, you have to have that type of input and so the child doesn't need to get to a point that they think they're smart enough to run their own life. You know, there was a story or an um, essay, a documentary that came out about elephants in Africa and <clears throat> these elephants were, uh, they were young elephants and they were causing havoc I mean, they were fighting with each other and they were tearing up, trying to knock down trees and vegetation. And it was just a a nightmare for uh, the people there and it was causing other animals to suffer and also the society. So they didn't know what had happened. Well, they began to research and find out where all this was coming from. Because of all the poaching of the adult male elephants, there were no adult elephants left in the herd. And in that society of animals. The, the males are the one that kind of kept the control of the herd and there was no adult males in the herd. So they said, we've got to do something. This forestry and everything is going to be tore up if we don't do something. So what they do, they flew in male elephants at the cost to the country. They flew them in, put them in those herds. Well, it didn't take long before, man, those males got out of those trailers and everything and man, they started flapping their ears and more of the trunk. You know, they started making all that noise that elephants make, and that was pretty good, wasn't it? Was that sound okay? <laughs> and, uh, that just came out. I wasn't expecting that. I can't sing, but I can do elephant, I guess. But anyway, uh, so if the ensemble needs some elephant background. And they start doing all this stuff that elephants do and raising their heads and getting their tusks. And I guess in, in elephant language, that was, that's enough of that. Or that's drawing the line right there. We're not going to put up with any more of that. The control starts now. That's what those young elephants, I guess, heard from all that elephant flapping and ear flapping and 
noise going on that that's what the communication was. And they straightened up. No more destruction. No more devastation. No more fighting. It all just kind of wrapped up. So even in the animal kingdom, without any kind of control or guidelines, that's what will happen. If we look at our society, as we've been mentioned throughout this series, we can see a lot of it stems from this. You know, that there's, if there's no guidelines in the home many times, and many, many times that spills over in society. And so we can see there's a good balance in between these two extremes. The next one is, never humiliate your children. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will bring grace to those who hear. Edification. You say, well, I can't correct. I can't tell them they've done wrong. I yes, it's how we tell them. It's how we tell our parents it's how, or our children. It's how we talk to other people. We can, we can say something negative, but we can say it wholesomely. We can say it with edification. We can give grace. You know, even though they've done something wrong, we can still show, okay, you did this. And I always try to encourage our, my children to like, okay, you messed up, but that doesn't mean that you're going to mess up in the future. And that doesn't mean we're going to hold anything against you. You did it. You've got your discipline. And now we're going on as if it didn't happen. You know, it, you've done, paid the price and done the thing. We don't think less of you. I mean, there's some edification. But the last thing we want to do is humiliate or embarrass them. Some parents can say, you know what? I know how to stop this behavior. We have company over, other people over. I'll just embarrass them right out in front of everybody. They won't do that again. Well, they may not do that again, but the wound that goes so deep from you embarrassing them and humiliating them will not bring about the results that you intend. Let me ask you this. If you do something wrong at work, would you rather your boss take you in his office and lecture you and get on to you and whatever, or would you rather him right or her right out in the middle of all your co-workers lamb blast you there and just humiliate you? You wouldn't want that. You'd rather do that privately. You know, the embarrassing is not going to take the result that we want. We do that with some discretion and off to one side and, and find out, you know, a better way to do that. You know, our children don't want to even feel humiliated as well as even feeling like they're a burden. You know, some children feel like they're a burden. You know, they may a comment like, boy, I can't wait for these kids to get out of the house. Get out of here. I can get on with life. The child just feels like, who am I? Am I just a burden here you're ready to get rid of? It's like we've got some roaches here. Can't wait to get rid of the roaches, you know? They shouldn't feel like a burden that that kind of humiliation or, or anything like that, they need to feel like they're also treasured even though they've done wrong. The third one is know and understand your children. This was mentioned a little bit. We're going to cover it a little different arena here in the sense of don't exasperate them. But how do we not exasperate them? Remember that children long to be understood. They long to be known. And that's all of us. If we have a relationship that's going to go anywhere, whether it's husband-wife, whether it's parent-child, whether it's friend-friend, the way, only way it can go further is to know and understand that person more. You know, the more you know them, the more you appreciate them, the more you know what they like, what they dislike. Uh, they want to be understood. They want to be known. The only way we can do that is, one, be actively involved in their life. Look what, even when Deuteronomy talks about giving them the instruction of the Bible, look at the word when. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So if there's no wins, you can't be actively involved in their life. It takes some time to be involved in what they're involved in, to be part of their life, you know, spending some time being in their world and not necessarily you and them. That can be done in several ways. It can be done on times together, times in groups, whatever, but they want to see that you're involved in the things they're involved in and their world that makes a difference. Matter of fact, there was a, a young man, Charles Francis Adams. He was the grandson of the president, President John Quincy Adams. And his dad, the president's son, 
wrote in a diary that said, went fishing with my son, a day wasted. They later on found his son, Brooke Adams' diary. It was located and still in existence today. His diary on that same day said, went fishing with my father, most wonderful day of my life. You know, to the dad, a day wasted. To the son, the most wonderful day of his life. You know, those are the things that are treasured when you're involved in the lives of your children. And then to listen to them. You know, to be heard. Even if what they say is made not what you want to hear or may what may it be against something. But at least they're heard out. You know, this is how I feel. This is what I think. You know, it may be in something that they are struggling with, with some truth, even the truth of Scripture. But at least you can hear from them, hear what they say, and then when they say what they say, they'll be more likely, I believe, in return to hear what you say in the sense of taking it in. They're going to listen to you because you're going to, as a parent, do the talking one way or another, but at least I believe there's more likelihood to take it in. So they're listening, they, and they know that you're listening to them. The fourth one is to show love for your children. And we're going to focus on this one, on trying to find out what is my child's love language? What is it? In other words, you know, you want to speak all the languages of love, but you want to find out primarily what your child's love language is. Gary Smalley wrote a book on the love language. As a matter of fact, he later on wrote a book on your teenager's love language. As a matter of fact, there's an uh, instrument online which I went to, and you can find out, go through the questions and and by answering the question, you can find out what your child's love language is. To help focus it in, if you don't know it, uh, you can do that little survey even online. You see, Jesus used all these five love languages. That's how He showed love. How more should we show love to those around us, especially our children? Because if we look at it, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. That's in all of our... We always have to have relationship. The child sees relationship, then the child will see that the rules are rules based on love. And that won't necessarily be likely to lead to rebellion, but without it. So we need to focus on the love. So what are the love languages? Number one is words. Words of affirmation. I love you. You're the greatest. I'm proud of you. You do this the best of anybody I could ever think of. You know, the way you talk to people is just the, the, the best. The way you do this is the best. You're the best shot. You're the best this, and you're the best that, and you really are a, a, a joy to be around, and you're really a, a, a treasure to our family. You know, those words, they just soak those words in because that's their main primary love language is hearing the words over and over. See, another reason we want to find their language is because that is what they believe says love to them more than anything else. You know, it's like us. You know, if, if we speak English, we believe everybody else will speak English. So we go somewhere else and they don't. You know, it's like, well, I'll take care of this. Where is the rest room? Like if we say it slower, they're going to know what we're saying. I mean, still, they're still not hearing it. But, you know, we're, they've got to understand us. This is our language. And it ought to be your language if you can't understand. You know, we just feel like everybody ought to know it. You know, but it's not. We speak, if I had, which I wish I did, speak other languages, I don't. So I have nothing to go back to. But if you have several languages, one of them is usually your primary. And that's the one you usually speak. So when people don't understand you, it's what? It's frustrating, isn't it? You know, and you think, I wish I knew another language so I could communicate. Well, many times to our children, if we're speaking not their love language, we're speaking our love language. See, we have a love language too. And we tend to believe everybody else ought to have that language too because it's ours. And that's what we're speaking over and over and over and over. And if it's not theirs, they're not hearing love, love, love. They're hearing... It's like, what are you saying, you know? I'm saying love to you! Well, I'm not hearing it because words are your language and words aren't my love language. I mean, good to hear them, but that's not really the, that what means the most to me. 
they mean the most to you. So you, if you learn your parents' love language and its words, then that's what you need to be telling them. And so we see that that's one way to show love, and Jesus used the, that. He used words. It's also actions. For this child, it's to do something for them. You know, they may have a car and you, you wash the car for them or you change the oil or you fixed it or, you know, maybe they had a busy, busy week and you did one chore for them. And I'm not saying all the time, but you did that just to bless them, you know. Or you did this for them or you, you, you did some sort of service for them, some sort of action for them that to them means love. So for this child, you can say all the words you want. They don't mean anything. You do one little thing and they say, man, my parents sure love me been telling you that forever. Yeah, but you did that little activity for me. Yeah, I know, but look, that doesn't matter. That's their love language to them that says love. Because every child's different, every person's different. And you say, well, God, that next one's everybody's love, everybody love language. We all like gifts, you know. Is that a car or boat or motorcycle? You know, what is, no, these are, these are not expensive things. I mean, they could be, but if you end up just doing that, you know what your children do? You're trying to buy my love. And you know, you've seen that. Rich people that try to buy their kids love, you know, they're buying all these expensive things and more and more and more and more and more. Well, that's not the issue. You know, you may go buy and their favorite thing is a Hershey candy bar and you spend a buck, you know. I said, well, you hadn't bought a Hershey candy bar in a while, I guess. But, you know, you know what I mean? You just spend a little money and you get that on the way home and you say, hey, I bought this for you. Oh, and what they're thinking is you thought of me. You're thinking of me. And so it's not the money, because otherwise you can't buy love, but you thought of them, and so, or if it's a one little, two dollar little flower, and say, hey, that's for you. You know, whatever it is, don't pick it out of your neighbor's yard, but you know, you, you, it didn't cost you much. It, it was just the thought that counted. And for this child, that speaks love to them. The other is quality time. You say, you know, when you spend, not with the whole family necessarily, not with other, the other siblings, but you spend some time just with them, whether it's talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, going somewhere with just them, going to eat with just them, spending undivided attention. You don't have your cell phone on, you're not checking messages, you're not doing texts, you're just paying attention to them, giving them individual quality time. If that's their love languages, the others probably don't mean that much to them. Like, that's what I want. Woo, my parents love me. Why? Man, they spend that quality time with me. Why? Because that's the language they, that they hear. And the last one is touch. Whether it's a hug, a pat on the back, you know, that they feel like, you know, that's love for me, that you gave me a hug. You know, you gave me a pat on the back. You, you showed some, some of this touch in, a, in, in this way that meant the world to me. Now, with all of us, we like them all. You know, if money's not an object, my favorite seafood meal is a, is a platter. And my favorite thing on the platter, if it, if it were to come with it, is lobster. And of course, that would be the most expensive thing. You know, and it's usually the smallest little thing because it's the, it's the most expensive. But it has all the other seafood on there too. So I can have a little of everything. Now if it was my choice, and it was the same price, I'd say, make it half lobster. And all the rest, make those other three or four items the other stuff. That's kind of I am, and I believe children are, and you are, with the love languages. I like a little bit of everything. Don't leave any of it out. Give me just a little everything but make more of it lobster. That's my primary. You know, fill it up with that and all the rest can add on. And that's what your children is. Find out what their lobster is. And primarily give that. And then make sure you don't leave out all the rest because it's not that they don't like that at all. Don't leave that out. And so the child feels loved and they feel appreciated and they feel like you care when you're speaking their language. The next one is, show love to your spouse. And I said, that frustrates my children. You don't love your spouse, and you start being unkind to your spouse. That hurts your child. That exasperates your child. 
very much. Do you know what one of the, and it happens, but we pray it doesn't, one of the biggest fears, that, and I've talked to adult children who were devastated. When there's a divorce, it really, you know, the children, even if it isn't a divorce and they think they may be, that's a fear for a child. And I've even talked to adult people and said, man, my parents divorced. I mean, they may be 30 and it's still hurting them. You know, there's still some things that they go through. So here, a child wants to see the love that you have for their, their mom or dad or stepmom or stepdad because the Scripture talks about loving your wives and loving husbands. And that's part of the exasperation. If you think that has no thing to do with the parenting, you're wrong. Because it does. It has a lot to do. They want to see that love being shown to the others. You know... Side effect of having the marriage conferences. Yes, working on the husband and wife, but what a blessing for your children to see. You're investing in love for your spouse. That they say, hey, my parents are pouring things into what matters most to me, and that's the love they have because that's an investment in them staying together. No, it's not a silver bullet that's going to cure everything, but it is them seeing you take an investment. And yes, that was a free commercial for the marriage conference, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm preaching, I'll say what I want. So anyway, but anyway, it is. It's something we should invest in to say, hey, this is, this is what we, we don't have, this only comes up once a year. We'll make that investment. This is us. This is something that's important and I'm going to pour into this and boy, what a blessing that is to your children to say, man, that, mom and dad, man, they love each other and they're, they're working on each other. You know, they, now we're not only going to camp and youth camp and children's camp. Oh, those are all good things. They're going to their marriage camp for lack of another term. You know, they're, they're working on them. So that's what a child wants to see is the love that the parent has. Don't set unrealistic expectations for your children. Sometimes we can be perfectionist and set the bar. Now you say, well, Brother Tim, don't we want them to be the best? I mean, try to make the best grades and try to do the best and all that. Yes, we always teach our children, do your best. We should always do that. But what if the best isn't good enough? What if there's always criticism, always judging, and always not missing, not making the bar, and just no, no kind of encouragement that where they are is okay. Yes, you may encourage them to, to go further, but they don't feel like you're, they're a failure and that your love is performance-based. In other words, I love you if you perform. I love you if you make good grades. I love you if you get a home run. I love you if you make honor society. I, you know, if they start knowing, thinking it's performance-based, and not just trying to do what's best for them. And you set the... It's the same way in marriage. There are some couples where one or the other have set expectations that the other one can't, can't ever meet. In other words, they keep trying and trying and seem like the bar keeps getting higher and higher with the couple. In other words, the husband feels like he can't measure up, the wife feels like he can't measure up, and then the children feel like they can't measure up. In other words, there has to be some line that's saying, hey, you're doing good! You can do better, but man, I appreciate you for where you are. I guess nobody has frustrations on their marriage deal like that. Don't you? Isn't it frustrating when you feel like the bar is too high? At work, you feel like the bar is too high. Maybe it's like there's no appreciation for where you are or what you did. There's always got to be more and more and more and more and more and more. You like to be appreciated for when you do accomplish what you accomplish, and your children want that too. Matter of fact, the wise woman builds her house. I know a lot of guys are going to go home and say, honey, Here's your tool belt and your hammer. Pastor Tim said, get busy. She built her house. What am I doing out here in the heat working? Well, you know, this is an analogy of building the home, the family, the, the inner structure of the house. But isn't it unusual that it doesn't say the home, it says the house because it is symbolic that she's building her house. You ever seen a perfect house? I mean, they all have got imperfections. I don't care what house we have. You know, if you don't think so, you know, try to start adding something to your house and you do that plumb line and say, is there an absolutely straight wall in this house? You know, I mean, everything's a little off. You know, you say, do I go with the floor or the wall? I mean, you know, everything has its imperfections and so does every family. So does every child. So does every parent. We all, yeah, we strive to be all that God's called us to be. But if there's always fi fault finding and criticism and all of that, then it just keeps getting worse and worse. And a lot of times this comes from many times a parent that's wanting to live out their life through their children. I never was that good in baseball. 
now they're going to be good in baseball. And then you're just, just pressing and pressing. That's not saying the sports press, but you press and press because you're living your life through them and they have to succeed because when they fail, you fail. And when they don't make the deal and you think, well, my reputation's at stake now, and they feel that pressure. And the pressure has to do with many times the parents living their life through their children instead of letting them live their life and not see that their love's, your love's not based on performance. The next one is avoid playing favorites or comparing your children with other children. And the book of James talks about the attitude of personal favoritism. James obviously is talking about the church. We shouldn't play favorites in the church. Somebody come in rich, and you think, oh, huh, they'll really tithe a lot of money there, and they're treated well, and they're treated, he talks about the scripture, giving them the best seats, and treating them different, and then somebody come in with all rags and stuff, and we treat them differently. The Bible says we shouldn't show any kind of favoritism in the church. We're all on equal ground. Why? We're all saved sinners. I wasn't quite as bad a sinner, and I got more money, and I got more education. Sinner! We're all on level ground. There's no way to elevate yourself. You know, we often say we have the same chairs up here that they have down there. <laughs> Nobody's any better or worse. We're all sinners. And so we don't show favoritism also for our children. Oh, look at the havoc that caused in the Bible. Isaac played favorites with Esau. Rebecca played favorites with Jacob. Jacob played favorites with Joseph and Benjamin. And it goes on and on. Look at all the problems in Genesis. It all stemmed from all that, a lot of it, from all that favoritism. My goodness gracious, it just caused havoc. It caused some brothers to even say, we're going to sell our brother into slavery and wanted to kill him. Made him a coat and didn't make us a coat. And just playing favorites, playing favorites. And that doesn't mean at times that you're going to, you know, somebody did an accomplishment and you recognize them and you make a big deal on that day for that child and you make a hoopla. But there's other days you make a big hoopla of another child. And overall, the child says, overall, my, ch my parents love us all equally. Even though there at times there's, we're elevated on that particular day for something. Because, and they don't want to hear you compared to other kids. Well, old Johnny over hit three home runs. He struck out. You know, they don't want to hear them compared with the other kids. I mean, you may talk about it, but you don't, they don't want to be compared. No more than you want to be compared. What wife wants to hear her husband say, well, that wife over there. And what husband wants to hear, well, that husband over there. You know, nobody wants to hear that. You know, well, her husband took her to the south of France. Her vacation. Took me on the south side of town is all you took me in. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to be compared, and neither your children want to be compared. They are who they are, you know, and deal with it that way. But favoritism will cause them always to be exasperated, just like it causes us to be that way. But stay consistent with the rules. You know, we can't let the rules change by our emotions changing. We have to stay consistent. Matter of fact, I read one time three things. If you want something done, there was this. Arthur, I can't remember who it was. There's three ways to get something done. Do it yourself, ask somebody else to do it, or ask your children not to do it. <laughs> you know, but even when the rules are rules and they're asked not to do something, you still have to be consistent with them and they need to be clear and the boundaries need to be set. I mean, can you imagine a football game, you know, that has boundaries on it? Offsides, out of bounds, whatever. Can you imagine the referees changing that all the time? You're out of bounds. Right there. No, we move that. You know? That's a penalty. Why? Well, we change that. Well, you can't do all that in the middle of the game. I mean, uh, out of bounds, out of bounds, clippings, clipping, whatever the rules are, the rules are. You can't change them during the middle of the game. That would frustrate the players. They want to know what the boundaries are and the rules are, and I, they can deal with that just like a football team has to know them. And if you're going to change them, that's usually done at the end of the year and you get the new rule book and it's laid out. So keep consistent. God's consistent in His commandments. The ninth, live the right example for your children without hypocrisy. Live without hypocrisy. Yes, we can't be perfect. Look at what... Uh, oops, let me go back. That scripture's still there. Look at Matthew 23, 3. 
Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds. These are the Pharisees. For they say things and do not do them. That'll exasperate your children. Live this way. Do this. Act this way. But I'm not going to. Well, I better never not see you drinking. Never. <laughs> you know, they can't see you telling them not to do it and then do it. You say, well, I can't be perfect. We're not asking for perfection. Here's a few ways to avoid that. One, keep your word. If you say it, do it. Number two, admit when you're wrong. If you're wrong, say you're wrong. So you can't be perfect, but when you are not perfect and you do mess up, and it won't be viewed that way as hypocrisy. You say, hey, I told you don't... And you know, I, I've even said these things. I said this and I shouldn't have said it this way. I told you to be kind on this thing. I wasn't kind. Uh, you know, I, I did this, said this to your mom. I shouldn't have said that because a man's supposed to love his wife. And I did this and I'm sorry and I've already told her that. I won't. And whatever you do, if you do it, just admit you're wrong and, and tell them that. They'll appreciate your humility and they'll also know that you're not being a hypocrite. You are working on doing and being like Christ. Ask for forgiveness when you do wrong. In other words, that's your opportunity to say, please forgive me if it's toward them. Don't neg neglect or disrespect your parents. They're saying in their head, you want me to respect and love you, but you don't respect or love grandma and grandpa. Those are your parents. They're watching how you treat your parents. Like the little girl, she noticed in her home they brought the mother's father in because he was getting old. And because of his illness, he just, he, he, he was about blind and his hand shook. And when he was at the table, he was always spilling food and it was running out of his mouth. He, it was just a, a real big mess every time they ate. And so the parents got together and said, okay, you can't sit here at the table anymore. We've made you a little table right over there to the side. And so we'll serve you the same food, but we're going to serve it to you over there and we're going to eat over here. Well, after a while, the dad was walking down the hallway and he noticed his daughter was in her room and she had a little tea set and she was going on. And so the dad sat down there and said, hey, what are you doing? I'm playing tea. And she poured. And, and he went ahead and sat down with her and poured and said, well, you also have a tea set set up over there. What's that? I said, that's for you and mommy when you get old. Hmm. You see, they're watching. And you want to be able to tell them, you treat me when I get older the way I treat my parents when they got older. And you respect me the way I respect them. You love me the way I love them. Because they watch and they want to see what's going on in your life. If you're doing what you're asking them to do with your own family? Are you showing them all the respect that you should show them the same that you want to be shown by your children? Don't focus too much on outward beauty or accomplishments of others. In other words, if they see all you do is notice how handsome or beautiful somebody is or their accomplishments, if that's all that's most important, then your children pick up on that. A lot of times we can't do too much about outward appearance, we can do the best we can, or our accomplishments, we can do what we, God's given us the gift to do, but we can always work on inward beauty and the things that God allows us to do for Him, we can always do. And so if we see, they'll see, oh, the things they pick up on are character. Look at that person. Wasn't He so nice doing that for that person? Look at that person over there. Do you know what he did for somebody? He went and did this. They're picking up that your most important thing is not looks and not accomplishments. It's what people do in character and what they do for Christ. Well, I couldn't wait to go home and talk about, you know, that what was his name? Derek Carr. Highest paid NFL quarterback or NFL player, period. $25 million a year. Just signed that contract for him. They asked him, What's the, what are you going to do now? $25 million a year. You know, I'm sure they're at like, I'm going to go to Europe, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go that, I'm going to go buy a new house. I'm going to... His question was, what are you going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is tithe. When I made $700 in scholarships in college, I tithed off that. 
and so I'll tithe off this. Boy, don't you know they dropped the microphone on that one. I love Jesus, and he gets my tithe. That's what I do first. <laughs> I, it's his money. <laughs> and my wife's still going to clip coupons. And that's what he said. She clipped them before, she's going to clip them now. See, that's what I wanted to come home and say, whoa, let me check out this guy. Not that he's a quarterback and how good, but man, he loves the Lord. He's going to tie that $25 million. Can you imagine that check? Woo. Yeah. Amen. So we, we don't focus too much on the outward of the achievements, but on the character. Don't be an angry person yourself. If we're angry, they'll respond in anger. We shouldn't be an angry person. Leave that anger alone. And husbands, don't make your wives be the spiritual leader. Mom brings them to church. Mom has to do the things. Mom, the dad always saying, hey, we're going. We're on church. They want to see that dad's number one priority is God. You know, my parents, both my parents, you know, if we, unless we were sick or they were sick, we were in church. You know, there was no if, ands, or but it. But it. <laughs> you had to come. You were going to come. And I was like, well, Brother Tim, I don't know about making them go to church. They might have a warped view of God. If you force them. Well, don't send them to school then because I have a warped view of education because you made them go. Oh, no, that's different. That's, that's different. How? They're going to be dead one day and they won't need any education, but they're going to be in Christ. That's forever. Their spiritual life lives forever. I'm not going to make them do anything. It's going to make them... Now, I know when they get older, they can make their decisions. But while they're in your care, be the spiritual leader. Be the man that God's called you. It shouldn't just be the mom. It should be both. And be the example to them to follow. As a Christian, as a spouse, as a parent, as an employee, they learn what's important from you. And they watch you. You say, well, I can't be perfect. We're not asking for perfection, but we're asking for them to be able to see your life and to be able to reflect and try to model you. Now, yes, ultimately the model is Christ. But we need to be what God's called us to be. And then the last point is keep in mind that being an earthly parent should help you relate better to your heavenly parent and vice versa. Do you, it, it's the, the beginning of the model prayer was our Father which art in heaven. He's our heavenly Father. He's our spiritual parent. He, he's, he's God, but we to address Him as our Father. And boy, what, what could we can learn from that? Do you realize, I, I've, I've taught many times, I still believe it, that everything is in existence for spiritual reasons. You say, well, what's, why, why did God make husbands and wives? Did He need to have husbands and wives? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. He could have done it another way, but He was given an example. God, Christ is the groom, the church, we are the bride. And we could see a relationship more clearly. Well, He had to have parents. No, He didn't. Brother Tim, how would we populate the earth? He'd do it just like He did with Adam and Eve. Boom, adult. Boom, adult. Boom, adult. Could he have not done that? Sure he could. He could have continued that same method of populating the earth. It didn't take much, just keep making them. Well, why did he choose this method? Well, I can't get into the total mind of God, but I believe the same reason, so that it could help us spiritually. You say, you know, I've, some of my children, sometimes they don't listen to my advice and they don't do, they don't obey. And God may be telling us, now you know how I feel. You're a parent. That frustrates you, don't you? You want them to obey. Why aren't you obeying me? Your heavenly Father. Yeah, but it seems like when I tell them stuff, they don't think that it's for their own good. God may be saying, is that why you're not obeying in that area? Because you don't think that part of my word is going to be for your good? Well, they're not doing their chores around the house. Are you doing what needs to be done around my house? I think only one person heard that. Are you not doing what needs to be done around my house? This is my house! And we don't call them chores. 
but there's some things he needs done around his house. And for his people, they're called spiritual gifts and service unto him. Lord, I know how you feel. I know what you're doing. And maybe some parents say, you know what, I, I don't think my child may be grateful enough. I've done so much and they want more and more. You know what's coming. I've given you all this and you're mad about that. When I bankrupt heaven to give you Jesus and you're not grateful for what I have already done. See, I mean, there's so many applications. It should, it should help us by seeing how God is our Father. It should help us be a better parent. And being a better parent, it help, should help us grow in Christ. Even as a child with parents, it should help you. You know, some people may have a work concept of their heavenly parent because their earthly parent wasn't what he or she should have been. But you need to put that behind and say, you know, God's my parent. Even if my parents didn't do me right, God's still my parent. And He'll always be my parent if I know Him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as you stand to your feet, our music team comes.